Understanding global wind patterns is one of the toughest topics in Earth systems. And in this video, I want to break everything down step by step in detail and build our understanding of this concept. Before we get into the actual global wind patterns, I want to get some definitions out of the way and do a little bit of review in basic chemistry and physics that we need to grasp before we get into it. Solar radiation is the single most important factor that impacts the formation of global wind patterns. Insulation refers to the amount of solar energy an area of land is receiving. Insulation is greatest at the equator where sunlight is essentially hitting the planet face on. Now, because the planet is curved, the farther away you get from the equator, the less direct light you are receiving. And you can actually demonstrate this yourself. You can grab a flashlight and point it straight down, and you can kind of draw a circle around the light circle. And if you hold the flashlight at an angle, the resulting oval has a much larger surface area. The flashlight is releasing the same amount of light energy, but because it's dispersed over a larger area, the insulation or the amount of energy um, you're getting per unit of area is much lower. Let's actually talk about how air ends up being warmed. Now, I am simplifying a very complex topic in physics and, and physical chemistry here, so bear with me. Photons are essentially particles of light. Now, photons carry the energy of light, but don't have any mass. It's just a way to look at light and describe the properties of light in order for us to make sense of the physics we're about to cover. Now, the energy of the photon corresponds to the frequency of an electromagnetic wave. And yes, sunlight is an electromagnetic wave. Light has this particle wave duality where sometimes it can be described as a wave and sometimes it can be described as a particle or both at the same time or neither. It gets weird, but that's beyond the point. We've actually seen this, right? The electromagnetic spectrum includes the visible spectrum or the wavelengths of light that we can observe with our eyes. But it also includes all the other wavelengths and frequencies of light, all the way including x-rays and UV and infrared, all of it. So the sun releases this energy, all of this energy, and that light travels towards Earth. These photons carry the kinetic energy of light, and when the light hits the ground, the kinetic energy of that light is absorbed by the surface. The surface radiates or releases that light back up, but not as visible light. The surface releases infrared radiation, and IR radiation is one way to measure heat. So in more simple terms, the ground absorbs sunlight energy, which for us is mostly in the visible light spectrum, and releases or radiates back up heat energy in the infrared wavelength. So now we have to look at how air temperature affects air density, right? Light hits the ground, the ground radiates up heat, and that heat warms the air. So we have to first think about what a state of matter is and what that means for particles in motion. In a solid, the particles are packed quite tightly together and aren't really free to move around. They can vibrate and rotate. They don't have any translational movement. In a liquid, the particles are free to move randomly, but are packed together tightly enough and don't have enough energy to really move away from each other. That's why liquids fit the shape of their container. They have to stay together. In a gas, the molecules are not packed closely together and the particles move at much greater speed, so they don't have to stay next to each other. But let's actually zoom into this gas stage. Once we're in the gas stage, we have a temperature and density relationship as well. When a mass of air is heated, the particles start moving much faster and they move farther away from each other as a result. A warm gas expands bands as a result of this uh, faster particle movement. This results in warmer air having a lower density than cooler air. And masses with a lower density rise above masses with a higher density. Conversely, masses with a higher density sink below masses with a lower density. 
So now with all the heat in the air, we have some particles moving up because of lower density. We have some air particles moving down because of high density. Air pressure is the kinetic energy of air molecules hitting a surface. But in the context of climate and weather systems, it's especially important to consider the kinetic energy of air moving up and down. In warm areas where air has a lower density, the net movement of air particles is upwards. So we call that an area of low air pressure. In cold areas where air has a higher density and the net movement of air particles is downwards, we call that an area of high air pressure. Now, how does this end up resulting in winds that move along the surface? Well, diffusion is the movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to one of low concentration. In the case of the concentration of air molecules, we can reword this to say that air moves from areas of high pressure towards areas of low pressure. Now that we've got all this high pressure, low pressure, and diffusion out of the way, we can talk about convection cycles. A convection cycle is the movement of a fluid, which is both gases and liquids, both of them undergo convection, um, due to heating and cooling, where warmer fluids rise and cooler fluid sinks, which result in a circular movement that forms a complete cycle. There are four main components to the convection cycle, and they have different names depending on the discipline, textbook, diagram, whatever, but they all mostly mean the same thing, and these are the terms that I will be using. An updraft is a rising air mass that is moving up vertically. A downdraft is a falling air mass going down vertically. Surface winds refer to air moving horizontally, parallel with the ground. And the upper winds refer to air moving horizontally at the top of the cycle. So now we can get into the major convection cycles that we see on Earth. There are three major global air circulation patterns. The Hadley cells, the mid-latitude cells, those are sometimes also called the feral cells, and the polar cells. Let's go ahead and start with the Hadley cells along the equator. At the equator, because of relatively consistent, direct, year-round sunlight, you get the most solar energy and generally the warmest temperatures. As a result of this consistent sunlight, the air is heated to a great degree and begins to rise along the equator. Along the equator, this ends up resulting in very powerful updrafts, which are those upward vertical columns of rising air. And because the air is rising, we have an area of low atmospheric pressure. Because air is rising, air along the surface comes to take its place. Notice how we have air coming in from the southern hemisphere towards the equator and from the northern hemisphere towards the equator. These two air masses converge near the equator and actually end up assisting in the upward movement as they move upwards when they collide. They converge. Now let's take a look at what's happening along the 30 degree parallel. While this area is still technically warm, it is relatively cooler than the air at the equator. Now, because the air is relatively cooler, it has a higher air pressure than the equator. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure, which sets up that surface wind. The air that was rising at the equator reaches a high altitude about 60,000 feet above the ground, which is the height of the troposphere at the equator. Here, because you're so far away from the ground, which we learned is the source of heat for the air, the air mass cools off and begins to increase in density. Now here's where that 30 degree parallel becomes important again. Because the surface pressure at the 30 degree parallel is high, we know this is an area where the net movement of air is downwards. And this is where you see the downdraft of the Hadley cell, or the vertical column of descending air. Where the air is descending, it hits the ground, and you get an area where the air diverges. After the air column hits the ground, the air mass splashes down, much like how you would expect water to do when it hits a surface. As this air is falling, air from the upper atmosphere moves in to take its place. 
and this sets up the convection cycles we see at the equator, or the circular movement of air due to differences in air temperature and air pressure. Due to high insulation, air rises at the equator, which pulls air from the surface towards the equator. The air rides along the troposphere until it falls at the 30 degree line. Now let's get to the polar cell, or the farthest north and south cells. Because the far poles get the least amount of direct sunlight, these are always the coldest areas of the planet. Because the air is cold, it is denser and it sinks. And here's where it's interesting. Because you're at the top of a sphere, the surface air is pretty much always moving down towards lower, warmer latitudes where the temperature is relatively warmer and the pressure consequently lower, right? Things move from high pressure to low pressure. So we can think about the polar cell as always falling down towards the equator. This surface air movement collides with the air that was pushed along the surface from the downdraft of the Hadley cell. And when these two surface winds converge, they collide and push upwards. Now here's what's interesting. This particular updraft at the polar cell is not necessarily formed because the air was being warmed. The updraft is formed mechanically due to the convergence of these two surface winds. The air is pushed upwards to an altitude of about 20,000 feet, which is the height of the troposphere in the upper latitudes, simply because there just isn't enough kinetic energy to push the air any higher. Nonetheless, the air diverges in the troposphere, and this sets up the convection cycle in the polar regions. What's unique here is that the overall cause of the polar cell and its convection cell is the temperature difference between the polar regions and, well, quite literally the rest of the planet. That updraft is not really caused by a true solar-induced updraft. In fact, in some diagrams, the polar cell isn't represented as having an updraft or a downdraft. Rather, it is a spiraling column of air that is falling and then forced back up into the polar regions due to the surface winds traveling north from the 60th parallel. Of course, the same phenomena is observed in the southern hemisphere. The polar cell and the Hadley cell are both thermal cells in that the circulation pattern in those is based on temperature, right? The polar cell's high pressure system of sinking air is caused by the cold temperature in the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Hadley cell's low pressure system of rising air at the equator is caused by the warm temperatures and direct sunlight along the equator. Well, the cell that's left is the mid-latitude cell, or the feral cell in the middle. And this is a mechanical cell. The updrafts and downdrafts are caused by the kinetic energy of moving air caused by the other two cells. However, some solar energy is still involved, and this effect is a bit more pronounced during the summer months when the 60 degree latitude line does get some more sunlight as a result of our axis being tilted towards the sun. But keep in mind, the angle of inclination here is only about 45 degrees, depending on the season. So the sunlight is dispersed over a much larger area. So any warming is much weaker than what's being experienced at the equator. Nonetheless, it's not totally incorrect to say that the sun doesn't contribute to some of the energy towards the updraft system at the 60 degree mark. So we're just going to say it's a combination of converging air being pushed upward and some non-negligible warming due to solar radiation. The updraft of the feral cell is formed. Just like the other cells, as the air rises, it diverges at the troposphere and sinks down at the 30 degree latitude line. And these are our three major convection cycles, Hadley, Feral, and Polar cells. The Hadley cell has an updraft at the equator and a downdraft at the 30 degree line. The resulting surface winds move air towards the equator. The Feral cell has an updraft at 60 degrees and a downdraft at 30 degrees. These resulting surface winds move towards the poles. The polar cell is probably most appropriately thought of as a consistently descending system of air with the surface winds moving away from the poles before they're deflected back up to the poles due to the convergence of surface winds. But something here is missing. You may notice that the surface winds in our model move exclusively north and south. 
But on the diagram I showed in the beginning, that one, there are easterly and westerly winds. This change in direction is caused by the spinning of the Earth and the resulting Coriolis force. The Earth spins, but the Earth is a sphere. So while it seems counterintuitive at first, different points on the sphere spin at different rates. See, the entire planet makes one rotation per day, but the distance covered by that rotation is much greater at the equator. Let's look at it graphically. A point traveling at the equator has to travel this relative distance to make one full rotation. A point traveling at 30 degrees has to travel this relative distance to make one full rotation. But because they both take exactly one day to complete, the point moving along the equator has a much greater velocity. The Earth's circumference is 24,901 miles as measured along the equator. If one rotation takes 24 hours, then an object at the equator is, I mean, technically, moving at 1,037 miles per hour. Now, you don't feel this because the entire Earth is spinning at this rate. The atmosphere, oceans, you, everything. So from your frame of reference, everything is just moving at a relative rate towards or away from you, right? the net velocity. However, the Earth's circumference at 30 degrees is about 21,172 miles. So an object traveling along the 30 degree parallel is only traveling at 882 miles per hour. So now we have to think about the conservation of momentum, right? The momentum of an object is conserved unless some external force is applied. So if the object begins to move south from 30 degrees, right, down towards the equator, that mass has a forward velocity of 882 miles per hour. However, notice how everything else is spinning much faster along the equator. Because the forward velocity of the mass is slower, it will appear to fall behind on its route towards the equator. Now let's think about an object moving north from the 30 degree line up to the poles. Here, the forward velocity of the mass is 882 miles per hour, and as it travels north, the surrounding air is moving much slower. And because the forward velocity is faster than the air around it, it will appear to move forward along its route. This is the Coriolis force. In a rotating system like our planet, a mass will experience a force perpendicular to the direction of travel. This results in masses being deflected to the right relative to their direction of movement in the northern hemisphere. Notice our arrows. From the direction of travel, the mass was deflected right. An air mass moving southwards towards the equator was also deflected right from its perspective. In the Southern Hemisphere, objects appear to be deflected left relative to their direction of movement. Now, again, look at the dots. The air mass moving north towards the equator was deflected left relative to its direction of travel. An air mass moving south towards the poles is also deflected left relative to its direction of travel. This deflection is what causes the westerlies and the easterlies, which are named based on the direction the wind is coming from. Along the equator, because the wind is originating from the east, we call these the easterlies. These are also referred to as the trade winds, as historical reference for the winds that push trade ships along the routes in the tropics. The feral cells deflection results in the westerlies because the air masses, the wind, is moving in from the west. And finally, the deflection of the polar cell surface winds result in the polar easterlies, again, because the wind is moving in from the east. Now, these convection cycles result in much more than just global wind patterns. And for the relationship between these circulation patterns and how they dictate climate and the location of major biomes, watch the deep dive about geography and climate linked in the description.